I'm Simon Rowe. Uh, I'm from Epic Games. I work out of the London lab, and I'm the virtual production and ICVFX product specialist for Epic. So uh, just a little background on me. Um, at the start of my career, for about five or six years, I worked at Double Negative, or DNEG now, uh, and I worked in visual effects. And while I was there, I helped set up the virtual production department that they now have, and now goes and shoots lots of films. So in the past, I've worked on uh, The Matrix, Dune, Black Mirror, a um, little bit of Dark, and uh, like a few other things. But for uh, this talk, what I want to go through is something that I paid a lot of attention to when I first started doing virtual production, particularly with the volume work, which was color management. Uh, so in visual effects, this is kind of a uh, kind of a big problem we have to deal with anyway. So during a production, uh, an asset is made somewhere else, or you hire a contractor who's making an asset, and they're looking at a screen. And you don't know anything about the screen, but they're making decisions about color and about design. And anyone who's worked with any commercial clients or worked directly with a creative, um, you're very particular about the colors you're picking. So if this person's working in a way where you don't control what they're viewing or what we'd call their reference view, uh, you might lose some of the intent. So this became more important as we moved into virtual production because now there are more layers of this. We're, we're not just taking something someone's made on their computer on a screen somewhere. We now have to take that image. We have to put it through a GPU. That goes through an LED processor. That goes to an LED screen. And then that goes to a camera, and then it goes to another screen and another screen, and it's like, oh my god, is it going to look the same at the end? And you kind of, A, you want it to, B, you need it to. So I'm going to kind of be running through uh, how we look at this from the very start with something um, that we call the virtual art department, uh, which if anyone's familiar with, this, this is a bit of a new term that's been coined over the last couple of years to do with this idea of Let's take what we would normally do in post-production and bring it into pre-production. So you have your traditional art department that makes sets and designs the production. And what we see now is these folk work in tandem with what we call the virtual art department. So the people who would sit on a computer model, do texturing, do some lighting. And there is an overarching idea that when you're doing this, you're saving money and time later because you're making decisions earlier that stick, which is a big problem in feature films that I saw while I was in VFX. So you would get, a shoot would happen in September, it would finish in September. We maybe get the footage in October, November, and the film release isn't until maybe August or next September. Someone is still making creative decisions in May, but we're not shooting anymore. So. The decisions are kind of floaty the entire time that like, the, the film is being shot through to the time it's getting to VFX. People are still trying to make a decision. Where with the virtual art department, what we're getting people to do is decide now, because you can see it now, and it's at such a quality that you will be able to confidently say this is what it will look like at the end, or at least it will be very, very close to what it looks like at the end. I've, I've been on shows where the main character, who is a completely CG character, was still changing the costume design right up until a week before the film came out. So no one knew for that whole time what this character was supposed to look like. With the virtual art department, we're kind of saying, you know what it looks like now. Uh, and if you know what it looks like now, we can focus less on this constant, like, is it, is it not? And focus more on, let's tell a good story, because that's why we make films, right? So the next thing that we like to use this stuff for, because we can get to such a high quality early on, <coughs> earlier on, and we're getting people to stick to these decisions, is I don't know if anyone's run into these terms here, virtual camera, simulcam, and virtual scouting, where they're new pre-production tools. As it, new. They've been kind of used on and off since about 2002, but with like varying degrees of quality and success, where now we have these kinds of tools built directly into one reel. So when you're building your content, it's just kind of like a button you sort of sort of turn on, it's getting better, um, where you can quickly jump into these different modes of pre-production. And the term I use for this, uh, the advantages you get here are um, what is it? Uh, PPE, which is uh, Production Performance Enhancements. So 
like I was saying with making decisions on what your shot looks like earlier, this is what the virtual camera is for. So we've found a location, we go there, we do some photogrammetry, we get it processed, we bring it back. Um, and we only had to send one person there with one camera. Um, I, I did this with Death on the Nile because we had to use uh, uh, some of the pyramids in Egypt, and you are not allowed to film there. Like, it's never going to happen. So we do that, we bring it back, put it in Unreal, and we have the director come along and sit in virtual reality with some tools that we built for him. And now they're just spending a few days at home laying out their cameras and some shots so that they can give it to the director of photography later to also have a look at and light all within the same project inside of Unreal Engine. So again, what we're doing is we're taking all of these key uh, stakeholders in the film and they're making decisions that directly affect the data that is being used in the rest of the pipeline. That's super important. And then even more importantly is if you're doing this right, you might still be able to use these assets later on in VFX. Now, even if you don't, because it does happen a lot, like you end up with like gamey looking assets, or if you want something that performs really well in real time, it cannot look like how it normally looks when it comes out of an offline renderer. However, when you get to VFX, these people are normally only being given like napkin notes. Like someone sat down in a, uh, what we call a daily session and they've, they've kind of off the fly said, make it pop, make it nicer. You know, not very helpful notes. But if you've got this asset where it's like they've already, maybe they've had their own hand in using it because the, the, the tools kind of let them do a little more look development themselves. When the, you know, your, your grade A artist comes in and has something to work on, there's less guesswork involved. They're now actually making well-informed decisions. So instead of, instead of being brought maybe like 30% on the way through their creative journey and kind of being left with the last 70% 70, uh, 70 as like a game of telephone where they're, they think they're making the right decisions, but maybe they're not too right and then it's too late and now we can't change anything anymore because it's too late, we've spent all the money. This is more like they've been taken 80% of the way there and it's more of a case of we trust you as the artist, here is some really great reference, this is what we want it to look like, but like, make it that next 10% better. This is where color management comes into it. Oh, there we go. So the color management aspect of this is we've been making all of these decisions, and while we've been doing it, there are loads of different devices involved. I've mentioned a VR headset. Um, I didn't touch on it with a simulcam, but that would be an iPad. You looked at some stuff on like, a laptop screen, maybe a projector, and these are all different, what we call display devices, and they show color and emit color in different ways. So we have some management tools uh, that we like to try and use where we can. Lots of applications support it now. Um, I don't know like, if anyone in here has worked much in um, uh, DCC software, so anything like, like Maya, 3ds Max, uh, Substance, or like anything that lets you create content on a computer has probably run across this term open color IO, or you've at least seen something that says linear color management. So lately, uh, we like to try and get people to think about using open color IO if they're defining um, the specification for a show. Now I'm really sorry, this is gonna get kind of boring for like five minutes and it'll get a little more exciting and then like a little bit more boring again. Um, this, this, is like, this is a system that sits in the background that deals with uh, what, what happens to color in the back before it gets shown on your screen. So if you imagine there's, there's Unreal, Unreal Engine, and for all intents and purposes, everything that happens within that renderer is like real light. It's not, because it's a game engine, but it's, like, it's real light. Like If we could jump in there, you would see it how you see it with your eyes. So we need a clever piece of software that takes all those values, throws it on your screen, and so what you see on your screen is kind of pretty much what you would have seen in real life, because the screen isn't as capable as delivering as much uh, uh, what we call spectra as the real world can. It makes less colors. So it would be a nightmare if we left every individual to decide what this was like. So what someone does is you usually have a, 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 either a color department or you'll have like a color scientist or you'll, you'll hire someone on contract and they'll kind of figure this bit out for you. Uh, and you'll create some configurations. So these configurations are saying things like, my reference monitor is like, I don't know, an ISO, 
I have these color primaries. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, a color primary is like when you have your red, green, and your blue on a chroma graph, so like your CIE XY colors. It's, if I'm losing anyone, I'm so sorry. It's really hard to talk about color without talking about this. It's like a big blobby color thing, and you sort of plot some points on there, and you say when it's red, it's this XY value. When it's green, it is this XY value. When it's blue, it's this, and white is like somewhere in the middle, and we kind of pick that. You, you, if you've seen the term like D65 or D60, that's your white point. This is like how warm, how cool are my whites when I get towards neutral. These are then given to the people working in the programs, including Unreal, where you set them and you say, like, I'm looking at it on my MacBook, so I will choose my MacBook output device transform, or ODT is how you might see that. Uh, or I've gone into a projector room, and I'm looking at on a projector where it's been calibrated to 100 nits, and so I will use the 100 nits DCI-P3 profile. Acronyms, I know. Um, then what we start to consider, because all, all I've really talked about there is making sure color ends up in the right place when we get somewhere. Now I'm going to talk about ACES. Can I get a show of hands if anyone's heard of ACES before? Keep your hand up if you understand ACES. Perfect. OK. <laughs> all right, ACES isn't scary. Um, a a ACES uh, documentation can look like a nightmare if you're reading it for the first time and you, you haven't dealt with it before. The best way to think about ACES, in particular this thing, 2065-1, which you will just see as ACES or ACES AP0. All that means is it's an archival format. The idea behind ACES is film, images, color, exists in all kinds of ways, and we don't know what future technologies are going to be like. This has already been a problem for film in the past. So things were filmed on real film like 60, 70 years ago. I mean, sooner as well, but you, you get me. And then we have to put it on like DVD, then we want to put it on Blu-ray, and then we want to put it in like HDR. Some films can never be HDR now, because we, we never stored the color enough, and the film is gone. That's a shame. Uh, that's a loss of like historical data that's been created. The point of 2065-1 is this idea of having what we call an unreasonably large color box to put things in. So this, when I was talking about the, the XY values, the, these are the blobby color things that we talk about. And this is your CIE XY graph that they sit on. These white triangles represent what a display, or uh, in this case, a color gamut, can show you. So on the right, we have Rec. 709. This is like your HDTV. This is like your phone. This is like most stuff that you will see with your eyes. And then 2065-1 is our unreasonably large box where nothing, we're pretty sure, will ever exist that can represent all of those colors. Because you see these endpoints here for uh, green and blue specifically are outside of the visible spectrum range. I Meaning you can't see it with your eyes. And if we did have a screen that could make it, we were making ultraviolet and some other stuff. I don't know what ultra green is. It's not a real thing. So this, all of this preamble is we've now stored color in a way where we will never lose anything if we do everything right as we move through our pipeline. So uh, whenever we go to store data to be passed to another facility, like um, I'm, I'm a contractor, I've made some look development textures, I've stored them as 2065-1, and I've delivered it to double negative, and now double negative need a way to display it within their own color pipeline. But because we're all starting at 2065-1, we're making sure that the color, the color is just overrepresented. It's, it's, the, there's so much like resolution in the color that it's not going to go anywhere as long as we transform it, which is this Rec. 709 thing, and we take... Has this got a laser pointer on it? It does, doesn't it? Amazing. OK, so I have like a green here, and I need it to be represented on this one. What a color transform will do, we'll kind of move it over here, hopefully without sacrificing uh, its hue, uh, so it doesn't shift into becoming like a bit yellow or a bit blue, and without losing its saturation. Uh, you do that wrong, and you'll get like weird colors. But this is, what, this is literally what OpenColorIO does for you. As long as you've set up those configurations correctly, you get these correct transforms at the end. So, because this is where it can bite people. Um, you receive something, and if things weren't color managed, you're guessing color spaces. This isn't fun. Um, it's, you can take some like, pretty good guesses of what something was supposed to be, but 
what I personally hate, and it's slightly more of an artistic pet peeve, is you've lost intent. Someone chose a color because there was a reason they chose it, and if you change that even a little bit, you lost that person's intent. And if a film is supposed to be the vision of someone in their, the vision someone held in their head, put onto a screen for other people to enjoy, you're not doing it justice. Like you've you've lost some of that. Bad. Don't like that. Uh, you get a worse image. I think if I blast through this, oh yeah, your colorist will love that you've done this. Uh, if you get to grading and you haven't done this and they try to make some adjustments, I'll do weird stuff. I won't do what they wanted to do. So like you move your midtones and you'll get something like on one asset that's like a little bit greener than it really should be if it was wrong. And key, this is, this is about being mindful to the rest of the pipeline. Like the show doesn't stop at your department just because you don't work on the show anymore. And a film is made up of you know, like uh, 30 or 40 different departments that are affected by this problem. So, to my point of mismatched assets, what I've done here is I've taken the same asset inside of Unreal, and I've told it for the one on the right to interpret the color space incorrectly. I've, I've told it it was done in a color space that it wasn't done in. And you can see what's happened is now this is, this is oversaturated and kind of orange, but if, if I didn't show you this one on the, this one over here, you might look at that by itself and you go, that's fine, like it's, it's kind of rock colored, like that's, it's not my film, fine, I'll deal with that. But then we put that in there and it glows because it was in the wrong color space. So again, I'm, I'm really sorry to like keep driving this point home, as long as you're managing everything, you kind of don't have to think about this. Um, things will just look right in the end. And to like round off at least this bit in open color, encoding in color spaces, they're not a tool for making creative decisions. So this example here where I've gone, ah, it's kind of orange, it's fine, like that's a creative choice I'm making, like that's not your job. Uh, th th that, that was someone else's job to do that. And the color space, when set correctly, is maintaining that intent from the beginning to the end of your show. So now the LEDs. This bit's a nightmare when I first ran into it. So the first time I pulled up LEDs and I pointed a camera at it, we put up some color patches and we went, ah, oh, oh dear, other expletive. Um, they don't look the same. Uh, so what can we do about that? And so we went on this kind of couple weeks long thing where we got something called a spectro radiometer. I'm gonna say that correctly, spectro radiometer. Uh, which is like this kind of gun-looking thing that you, you aim at your wall, you show it a color, and then it gives you those X, Y values again. And it lets you know, like, wh what is it measuring? We do that, and we know roughly what the wall is emitting back to us. So we pick a red, we pick a green, we pick a blue. Then we shoot it with a camera, and we have a look at these two patches. So we've, we've, we've got the red we know we made, I'm going to do this from the other side. We have the red we know we made. We have the red we've measured out of the LED wall. We have the red that was recorded by the camera, which is a form of imaging device. But the values don't match. So we know we need to do some kind of transform to the wall to account for this for the camera. Now this creates a bit of a weird thing on set, where people will come in, they'll see the wall after it's been calibrated for a camera, and go, ah, those aren't the colors I picked. That's not how this should look. Make it more saturated you should be looking at what the camera sees instead, because in this situation, we're using the LED wall as what I'd like, I call a scientific display. It's, it's, uh, it's a display that makes images for other things that make images. It's not the thing you consume at the end. It's, it's got a different purpose to like your screen or this projector. And some of the reason this happens is because of this thing uh, called spectral signature. So in, in the real world, like in this room right now, there's loads of different types of lights in here. And if I had a big long graph with nanometers from like, uh, I think it's like 250 up to like uh, 900 or so, roughly, um, you get this kind of wavy sort of shape where things go from like ultraviolet to infrared and like super infrared. An LED wall can't do that. An LED wall graph looks more like it's like kind of flat, and then you get a peak at red, you get a peak at green, and then you get a peak at blue. And the light, because light physics, warning, incoming, uh, light is a bunch of waves, it hits stuff, it scatters, and it bounces out. Skin is a very particular one for this. LED white looks horrible on human skin. 
uh, because what happens is we absorb a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the green and the blue spectra, and then we absorb and scatter the red one, which is why if you've ever stood in a big bright white LED volume where you've shone a white LED at your face, you look really red. And it's just because all your blood vessels are bouncing that light back out. Where if you stand under a tungsten, it's got lots of infrared in it, and we absorb that deeper. It gives you like this healthy sort of skin look. So there's some balancing that you have to do there where you use your real lights to kind of make up for some of the missing spectra. Now, having said that, I know that there are LED panels people are making that involve uh, phosphors as part of the uh, what's called the subpixel architecture. So you have like a red, green, and a blue, and then some people add two white phosphors. And this lets you have two different color temperatures that only emit phosphorus light, which has a bit of a broader, nicer spectra. Then there's the camera's spectral signature, how it reads it. The camera's got a sensor on the back. The sensor is full of like a million little buckets where it collects light and it constantly samples it. And it's looking for red, green, and blue. But it's got like this Bayer filter over it, which if, if anyone studied camera sensors before, it's like that this is how it divides up and sort of filters the light as it comes in and then records it to the sensor. Different cameras use, uh, different camera manufacturers tend to use different Bayer configurations because it becomes part of the look. Kind of similar to how you might pick your film stock these days, you sort of pick your digital camera sensor, and your spectral signature is part of this. This is why we have to make a different sensor transform for each camera that we point at an LED wall, because it's always going to look kind of different. Like if I have an ARRI, a Sony, a Blackmagic, and a RED, and I point them at the same wall, showing the same patches, without a color transform on, or just with a color transform that was made for one of those cameras, none of those images match. Uh, they look different. So you usually have to film with the same camera if you're doing a multi-camera shoot on an LED wall, unless you're using open color I.O. So if anyone's ever shot with N-Display before and you have two cameras shooting, something that we put in there because of this problem was applying different color transforms to different frustums. So if I have an ARRI pointing over here and a RED pointing over here, I am not going to talk about what happens when they cross because that's a bit of a problem in itself, but as long as they don't cross they can be transformed separately from each other. And we will get the correct image through both of those cameras so that when you get to grading and you're editing between A and B, the background doesn't change. Your grading now becomes more, again, about creative intent. It's, it's less about, oh, God, oh my god, the red was wrong in this one. I've got to fix that. I've got to use this preset. It's, it's now more, you're not even thinking about it. It may as well have been a real location that was shot. And now you're just, you're just grading, which is what we want this stuff to be. It, it, volume shooting is never supposed to feel like, oh, I'm using all of this technology, I, I have to think about all of these new things. You do have to think about some new things. But at least when it comes to your film pipeline, you're just making a film, and it should feel that way. So this is what I briefly touched on before. There are two types of displays. There's your consumable display, and then there's your scientific display. Uh, I'm not going to hang around this one for a bit, because I think I've talked about that enough. Next fun topic, HDR, PQ, and gamma. Who knows what PQ is? Three, nice. <laughs> Who knows what HDR is? <laughs> Who's graded in HDR? Oh, wow, impressive. OK, cool. All right, Who uses gamma? Get out. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. OK. <laughs> so this is just a short video from a, oh, it's not going to play. That's fine, that's fine, it wasn't that important. It's just a video of a volume, we've seen lots of videos of volumes today. All right, so uh, what I like to do is separate what we mean by HDR from generally what people's understanding of HDR is. Usually what I find, people think HDR is, I got that new Samsung and it's got QDL LEDs and it gets like really, really bright, uh, it's super cool. That's kind of not what we're on about. Um, we're, we're talking about high dynamic range, like uh, you, you, you get a camera and like your ARRI has like 12 to 15 stops, I think, of light that it can record. The real world is full of like a giant range of light um, where our eyes don't even see all of it at once. That's why your eye iris opens and closes to adjust for the different levels of light that you see. Because the wall is a lighting tool on a volume shoot, we want to make sure that the wall is taking advantage of its giant range of light as much as we can, because these walls get really quite bright. Um, I think the one that you have on your XR stage here 
if it's the panel, I think it is, it gets to like 1600 to 1800 nits. It's pretty bright. But if you consider for a moment that the, the sky on an overcast day is, I think, 15,000, and then direct sunlight is between 25,000 and 50,000, that's not going to happen anytime soon. But it might. It might. Because Unreal Engine renders internally with high dynamic range, remember before I said, like, if, if you could go inside Unreal as a place, like, your eyes would see it like you would see the real world. We try and render in that way. And th the way we describe that is it's a linear renderer. So if I have a light and it has an intensity of an imaginary value of 1, and I go up a stop, the intensity is now 2. If I go up a stop to 3, the, pa the intensity output will have doubled again. This all happens before anything is transformed before a display. So we have a very special display. We have a display that not only gets very, very bright, we get control over individual pixels. So we can control the emittance down to a single pixel. Your, your regular screen doesn't do that. Like the, uh, this laptop, this screen I have here, has like a, like a backlight behind it, and it's just like one big light that gets brighter and dimmer. This projector is a single point light that reflects off here. Uh, this is like the worst case scenario. Like you, you couldn't really use it for as a lighting tool. With the LED wall, we surround ourselves with what is essentially a couple million really tiny, very powerful lights that we can control at t like 24 times a second, 48 if you're really brave. And what you need to keep in mind is because we can do this, you shoot the real world in HDR, even if your show at the end is an SDR show, even if it's like it's only going to projection, you don't go out into the real world and not shoot for a high dynamic range because it, it's just what happens in the real world. So we want to treat the volume in the same way. It's, for, again, for all intents and purposes, when you go there with a the camera to look at it, it may as well be the real world. If I stop my camera up, I should expect a stop more light. If I stop it down, it should get half as dark. Twice as dark? Uh, you know what I mean. So when we're shooting like this, it should be, if I'm just going to go to the next slide. All right, so I'll get to that in a second. Saturation is HDR as well. So what I was talking about was just the intensity of output. For saturation, I want you to think about the big blobby color thing again and those triangles. The LED walls don't have the small triangle that I had on the right. They've got quite a bigger triangle called Rec 2020, or P3 is a little bit bigger, or you may have even used ACES to the wall. I maybe wouldn't. Um, or you can use what you'll, if, if, if anyone's played with the LED processor, you'll see something in there that's called the achievable color space. This is the thing when the LEDs have come out of the factory, and they've, they've got the spectral radiometer, and they, they don't just point it at the wall, they point it at every single LED and test it. And what they're looking for is the lowest common denominator for the highest level of saturation that each LED can output. And then that gets turned into the achievable color space. If you work with the achievable color space on a wall that you have, as long as all of the panels have come from the same batch, you are going to get the highest level of color reproduction that thing is possible to achieve with. If you use something like Rec 2020, the wall might actually be below the limits of 2020, so you'll, you'll get saturations that are clipped. You might not notice they're clipped, but it is happening. And part, like, part of color management is like, even if you don't notice something is happening, it's, it's making sure that you're, you're keeping your content safe when you do this. So, uh, it's probably a very confusing thing I've said, dead sailors in the tunnel of bits. This is a little story I used to explain why you use 10-bit encoding when it goes to the wall, because I think people generally know to do this, but they don't know why that you're doing it. So if you imagine, there's, there's a boat, and the boat has 1,024 seats in it. This is, that's, that's the highest number 10 bits can represent. And I have 1,024 sailors in that boat, and they're going somewhere, and that place they're going is my LED wall. And I need to make sure that each sailor I gave a color to hold gets to the wall and shows the right color. But then they go through a tunnel, and it's the 8-bit tunnel, because someone said 8-bit somewhere, and I don't know why they did it, but I'm going to have a talk with them. And when they go through this tunnel, it does a magic thing to the boat. It shrinks it, and it leaves you with 256 seats. Now, I didn't say something about the sailors. They've got numbers on their chests. They've got, you know, like one, well, zero, 
talking about data, so 0 to 1,023. And now there's only 256 seats, but the guys above 256 probably should still be sat at those higher numbers, right? Like 256, like if, if I write down an RGB value, 255, 255, 255, what's that? It's white. But 255 at 1,024 is more like 25% gray. Uh-oh. Some sailor's going to die. So they start throwing sailors out of the boat. How do we pick them? We quantize them. So maybe like every fourth, uh, well, every fourth sailor gets to live and the other three, out the boat. Um, or worse, we don't have a system for that and boat, uh, like sailors just in order, but kind of start taking random seats in the boat. And what you get is banding. Banding's bad. Banding's really bad on a wall. If you point a camera at a wall and you've got banding, you think you see it, wait until you get to grading. Like you can't get rid of it, you will replace the wall. So, don't send the sailors through the 8-bit tunnel, because that would be bad. This is why you go to the NVIDIA control panel and you say 10 bits and you click apply, and then it doesn't apply it. So you, like, you click apply again and you're like, I'm definitely applying it this time. You check Windows and it says it's still 8 bits, so you go back. And you do this until everything says it's 10 bits. Because if you don't, the sailors will die and you'll have a bad image, and probably a bad film, and a really, really angry producer who just had to budget a bunch of rotoscoping and match moving because they can't use the footage on the wall. Also, your lighting would be bad, because you've now only got 256 levels of color to use, rather than 1,024, which is a magnitude better. Some people might be thinking, why don't you use 12 bits? Um, there is no reason to not use 12 bits other than bandwidth. Bandwidth uh, means that you probably have to spend, well, I'll say probably, you do have to spend more on the hardware you put behind the LED wall, and that can be in the order of like 10,000 pounds from London, sorry, uh, each time. Um, so we use 10 bits because we know we get very good representation with that. We tend to final stuff at around 10 bits when you do your final output. Um, and it's just kind of a happy medium. Uh, if we could use 12, we'd use 12. It, you, it just tends to use a lot of bandwidth. So now, here's why I don't like gamma. Gamma is fine when you're outputting to a consumable device. It, if I'm being completely frank, it's fine for the wall as well, but you're adding more steps, and there is a higher chance that you lose intent. So when you use gamma encoding, in fact, who is familiar with what gamma encoding actually is? Like what, what happens to something before it comes in and goes out? Same three guys. Who are you? OK. All right. Um, essentially, a signal is made on your computer. This is that real world space here. And it goes like 0 to 1. And if that was a graph that goes like 0, 1, 0, 1, it's a line like that. But if you show this line on a screen, uh, it, it looks kind of flat and weird. So we have to add gamma to it. The gamma is a function of relative output where it adds a curve. You may have seen this curve before. And what it's saying is for the values that are coming in that are like 0.5, actually out point, uh, out point, output as 0 0.18 because this looks more natural to my eyes. You have these kinds of controls on your TV. If, if people play games, and I'm sure you do, you've seen the gamma correction slider that you use. That's more there because you're in a bright room and you have a screen and you can't see the dark stuff very well. You, you normally see like there's two images and it says like move the slider until you, you, like, you can't see the logo on the left. And all, all they're doing is they're letting you by eye decide this, this is now dark enough for me to see but bright enough for me to not have lost contrast. Because if you do the same gamma correction in a dark room from like, you know, you've played something earlier in the day and you now play it later in the day and you look at it and you go, whoa, that's really washed out and bright. And it's just because you're in a different environment viewing it. That, so you're, you're changing that relative output. Great for consumable devices. I'm not so sure about the wall. Because when I was talking earlier about the wall, that we have these linear values that Unreal generates, there is a chance to be making content that generates values of light similar very, very similar to what you would get in real life, and then represent those with the wall, which is our lighting tool. This isn't for us to go like, you're not watching a movie on it, you're pointing a camera at it, and if you've put a light bulb inside of the content on your wall, you want that to give like a light bulb's amount of intensity back out, a light bulb's amount of saturation back out, ignoring all of the missing spectra from a halogen bulb being shown on an LED wall, but that's a... 
in good time we'll get to that. So when we do this with gamma to the LED wall, you now have to arbitrarily pick what is the brightest pixel in my scene and what is the darkest pixel in my scene. So you may have a scene that is the interior of a living room, and then you've got another scene that's the exterior, and like you're in space and the sun is behind you. You've got like a spaceship with like really bright lights on it. So you, you have to then make this config, the open color IO thing, and you say when there is this scene value of like 14, it's an arbitrary number make that equal one, whatever the brightest thing is. One means, in gamma, different things to different LED walls. If I've got um, an LED wall that's made of something that goes to 1,600 nits, and then I've got a ceiling that goes to 3,200 nits, uh-oh, what happens? They both showed one. This one's a lot brighter. We don't want it to be. We actually want it to output the same amount of light as the one behind it for the same thing. So, enter my favorite thing ever, not really but it's useful, PQ. All right, so PQ is, it is a type of gamma curve, kind of, but we call it a PQ curve. And PQ stands for perceptual quantization. Ooh, first time I've said that without tripping up. Um, what this does is your eyes see things in this way, that the curve was designed, by your, by your, uh, designed around your eye response. So you go into a dark room, we're really good at seeing really low levels of light. Like in shadows, we see a lot of details because once upon a time, we were being chased around by big animals that wanted to kill us and we hid in dark spaces, so our eyes developed really well in this way. And then we're less sensitive to bright stuff because the real world doesn't have that many really bright things. There's the sun and some artificial things we've made, like LEDs, like light bulbs, like TVs. And so the PQ curve is designed around giving you this kind of output response, where Toward, like this graph isn't showing it very well. This should be a logarithmic graph. Up, up to about 650 bits, we're representing only up to about 400 nits, if that. Yeah. And then the curve itself ends at about 10,000 nits. And this, is, this has been made in a way, similar sort of to how ASUS is, that there are no displays that can do 10,000 nits. Not for a long while. Anyway, like a really long while. If it catches up, we'll think of something else. Um, so we can encode stuff on this curve to say, when I output an unreal scene value of four, or it, well, I've actually written down one, uh, that's always 100 nits. When it's 10, it's always 1,000 nits, no matter what wall I put it to. As long as the LED processor is linearizing this PQ curve, and for those that don't know, that just means taking this bendy curve and then straightening it out and then outputting it on those LEDs. The example I gave where my ceiling and my wall have different max output values, I'm now not worried about that because all I'm telling the LED processor is there is 400 nits of intensity on that pixel. If your screen can output it, output it 400. If it's above the highest output level, that's fine. It will just clip. Sometimes that's okay. Like this, the ceiling, we don't necessarily point the camera at it, but we do use it as a lighting source. So even if the rear wall can't represent 3,500 nits, at least when that 3,500 nit source moves to the ceiling, it does output that amount, and we didn't have to change anything. It was, again, just part of the intent of what we've done. So and this, this, this is what frightens people on set. The thing on the left, is what a PQ encoded image looks like. That looks horribly wrong. You shouldn't ever really look at it when it's in this state. This is, this is like an invisible state it ends up in when it passes through the LED processor. So the LED processor sees this, linearizes it, and then we get an image a bit more like what's on the right. But you tend to get something kind of flat looking on the wall. And it can be unappealing is probably the word to use. But so is real life. When you... <laughs> Not to get philosophical, that's not what I meant. <laughs> but if you step outside right now, it's, it's a very gray, right? Um, th things are, like, they're not poppy, they're not very saturated, like, things are kind of flat. And that's what we want to do with the LED wall. We, the world is kind of boring to point cameras at. And then we point the camera at it, and we do things to the footage on the camera, we make the image look appealing. We don't want that image to already be appealing before it's gone through the camera, because your actor and your set stood in front of the wall are boring and we're going to make them look exciting with the content and not fight against each of them. So if, if anyone had seen this, I think it was about a year ago we finished this. Uh, this was the Marmot project when we were upgrading a bunch of our in-camera VFX tools at Epic. 
and we used PQ encoding and open color I.O. Uh, management for this whole show. When we do this, you can see the effect here. Oh, maybe not in this room. Uh, I should have picked a better picture. Trust me that there's quite a lot of detail in the shadows on this, because we're using a, using a mini LF to shoot this. Um, and then you have, you have this light source here, which is actually is real and sat in a car, and then you have this kind of sun setting thing happening in the background. Because we've encoded everything with PQ encoding, and we've managed our colors all the way through, this is what they saw when they were reviewing their content before they made it, and when we pointed the camera at it, we now had that range, and we weren't sat at the computer on the set, like looking at the wall, looking at the camera, looking at the wall, looking at my screen. I was like, oh, I think it's right, but I'm really not quite sure. I'm going to move that around. Like, we don't, that's a really bad situation to end up in with an LED wall. Uh, with this, it's more like you turned it on, you point at the camera, and then your DP goes, I'm good. I'm really good. But you want them to feel that way. So now, because I'm really bumping up against time, I'll quickly blast through some of the tools that we give you to make color adjustments once you're in the engine and you're shooting. But I'm going to make a very quick distinction, because I have this talk maybe six times a month with different companies. When you're grading, do not grade the wall. I get mad when you grade the wall, because you're doing that thing. You're making it look nicer. Don't do that. It's boring. You grade the footage. So let, let the signal go to the DIT, or DIT, and they will do the grading like it was like any other footage, and as long as you've managed everything to the wall correctly, they're able to develop a look that you can give to the rest of the pipeline, give to your colorist, give to VFX, and when they look at that footage and they apply the look, they get, a, they get something that we call aesthetic cohesion. When you don't get aesthetic cohesion, that's the thing where you look at your footage and you go, ah, it's fake, ah, it looks like CG, it looks like a game, and it's because things aren't matching each other, and no amount of Fiddling, there's another phrase I can't use right now because it uses expletives, but when you do this thing, you're just rotoscoping and you're like you're rebuilding your shot again. This helps you avoid that. So there is a distinction. There is grading that you do in your content. This is a little bit different. So usually what we get is someone looks at some content on a wall and they go, make it warmer. And someone grabs the, uh, the post-process volume, they get the color temperature, they slide it up, Everything's more orange. Would you do that on a real set? Can you do that on a real set? No. You pull in a light. You pull in a light that is warmer. So in your content, pull in a light that is warmer. Make the lights warmer, because they're going to react with the scene. Plug for lumen here. They will react with lumen, and you will get some secondary bounce light that acts more like warm, real light. These extra tools we give you here are for those little extra bumps that they want to make. They're all in the engine now. If they're a bit too head hidden, I'm so sorry. I'm trying to get more documentation out on these things. Um, but they, they give you three different tools to use. So color correction regions are kind of what it looks like. It's like a volume. You place it around some content. You have grading control. So you can change exposure, contrast, saturation, gamma, add some color. All of these use those same controls. The color correction windows, if anyone's used um, DaVinci Resolve, are similar to their power windows. So when you're behind the window and you look through it, everything through that window takes on the properties of that color correction. So uh, maybe on the wall there is a section that you just need to be a bit darker. You put a color correction window over it, and you lower the exposure, and you feather it a bit. And now off camera, this really bright thing is maybe not contributing so much light, and you're not having to physically go flag it. You've just got a tool that you can very quickly dim that piece of content with. And you'll maintain the reflection. The color corrections per object are a bit more specific, but you will, if, if anyone's operated a volume on a shoot, you'll find this something that you want quite a lot. The, the, the first thing was the first version of this. This is still useful. This is usually what people are asking for. They're like, that lamppost is too bright. Can you just make the lamppost a bit darker? Can you make that bin a little less green? And so you're able to like mask out that single object and reduce its colors. Again, winding back on color management, if your color management was good, these are all changes we can recover later. And when we go to VFX and we need to replace that bin again, we're able to undo all of those changes we made because we knew what the camera did, we knew what the LED did, we knew what the camera captured, and we knew what Unreal was making. I've got a feeling my last two videos won't play. No. That's fine. That's fine. 
There is a thing called the in-camera VFX editor. Uh, if you look this up, um, there is some documentation on that. It's, it's a collection of tools of all of these things in the same place, where if, again, if anyone's used N-Display and stuff uh, in the last year or so, you have to move around the editor quite a lot. This tool is a single panel where we put all the end display controls, these color configuration controls, all in a single place. So when you're operating a scene, usually you'll have like two monitors on an end display shoot. Your left monitor might be this ICVFX editor, and your right monitor is your regular editor. Your regular editor, you'll move assets around, you'll do your regular Unreal Engine-y type stuff. The thing on the left that I re oh, really wish I could have shown you, um, that will uh, give you more direct controls for what your DP is going to come up and ask you. Like, if anyone's done this, the DP will sit on your shoulder like a little bird through their shoot, and they'll be like, move that thing over there, make it brighter, make it darker, do this, do that, do this. Uh, the tool is made so that those kinds of operations aren't so difficult. Questions? <laughs> Um, you mentioned that it's a little bit tricky to do daylight in sunny situations. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, like, how do you see the technology handling this in the future, if at all? Oh, no. Uh, so there are some panels that I know are kind of coming that are able to do much brighter values. I don't know what they are, but they're a lot brighter than we currently get. Um, that's as much as I'm allowed to say on that. For for what you can do now, it's more of an artistic endeavor where you can do things like open up your iris and use less light in your scene and balance your real lights with what the wall is showing and start to get something that is brighter than it should be. It's just you, you then have to accept some problems of that, like your, your, um, your depth of field is a lot shallower than you really want it to be. And that, that's a problem because that's a creative decision people make, but it's, it's a way around it. Um, there are tools in the engine as well, like part of these grading tools, uh, where we have exposure compensation. So if you have a very dark scene and you need to make it brighter, or you have a very bright scene and you need to balance it darker again, because we have this concept of stops you can take advantage of as long as you've used color management properly, um, you're able to retain the look, uh, and then it just becomes about balancing your set lights and your camera settings. But it is difficult, it is difficult. <laughs> I'm going to take this as I answered everything in my talk. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? Hello. I'm Asa. Um, when you was talking about ACEs and when you were then talking about the color conforms mm. that sort of is a minefield of devices and all the rest of it, in a, I'm, I, I come from the cinematographer side of things and the very much filmic side of things and computers and things, but would I be right in saying that the sort of, the ACES part is a bit like camera raw? It's like the raw version of color that you can always return back to and then the other is like our proxy or our encoded H264 or whatever? K kind of, yeah, yeah. So with... Um, so that's what I'm taking away. I want to make sure I got it right. <laughs> so so with, with RAW from your camera, it's, it's everything your camera was able to perceive, but that RAW file m would fit inside of 2065-1 with a ton of space left. 2065 is best thought of as, as archive. It's like so, it's so big. It's like stupid big. Like anyone on the ACES commission would be like, yeah, it's a stupid big box. We don't really know why we did that, but it's really big. Um, but then you, you uh, I, I didn't touch on this. I'll, I'll quickly do so now. There are a few types of ACES. Um, there is uh, AP0, which is dash one, uh, confusingly. There is AP1, which is something you see as ACES CG. And then there is something called ACES CCT. Acronyms. ACES CG sounds, is for what it sounds like it's for. It's generally for computer graphics that have been generated because when we generate computer graphics, pretty much everything for now until we have spectral renderers, that's a different conversation, renders with red, green, and blue values, not with wavelengths. 
So we, we, don't qu we don't need quite as much representation. We need a lot, um, but maybe not as much. And because of the way computer graphics kind of figure out what light's doing with the solid angle equation, um, you, you, you can make a red that if you then store in 2065-1 and then you transform it to another color space can do a weird saturation shift. It can some, like your shadow might go like a little bit yellow or something. So we use ASUS CG generally for something that is entirely generated by a computer. Confusingly, that can still be stored in ASUS 2065-1. It's just you mark this in the metadata as you move it around your facilities. And then ASUS CCT, I kind of forget. Something to do with proxies. Look that one up. That's some homework. <laughs> I just had a question from the cinematography filming point of view as well, um, because we've talked a lot about the shift in process of the idea of pre-production. And in traditional filming, the production designer would be hired for the creative development prior to the cinematographer. But when we're talking about this kind of development, the cinematographer would need to be in pre-production at the same time yes. as the virtual art director in the development of those worlds because presumably in 90% of cases that's creating the ambient light and then you're going in and shaping for definition. Is the workflow allowing for that? It, it does. Um, it's, it's a change I'm seeing more often with um, uh, customer projects I assist on. So they, they will get their DP involved as early as possible. They'll get the production designer involved with the VAD department. There was um, mistakes, maybe not the right word, but mistakes, being made like a year or two ago where people would hire their virtual art department without those people being involved. And you would get a lot of um, creative tension later, yeah. um, which <laughs> is no good. Um, so y yes, um, like in, in, by the way, ask, you don't have to ask color questions. Um, I, I, I do a lot of this stuff. Um, this is a really good question. Um, the, thing, the features like multi-user, the things like simulcam and virtual scouting are, thi are, are to help this process. So what was it? It was Death on the Nile. Uh, I had uh, Kenneth Branagh was at home and did not want to come to the production office. So we sent him a laptop with a VR headset. And I set up a virtual private network back to double negative, and he was able to be in a virtual scouting session with me, still in London, so we didn't have too much latency, but we were in separate places in the same environment, able to look at the same stuff. So when he was giving me notes about things to, to get the artists to change, oh, you know, he was a floating head without a face, but it was Mr. Branagh, and I was able to get that feedback from him, and he, he was doing this before even the Karnak had been built at that point. And we were, we were scouting the Karnak before that had been built so that they could make real build changes to the giant boat. Because if anyone's seen the film, it is a real boat. We actually shot on that thing. And it was stored in a big uh, sound stage in Pine, uh, Long Cross? Long Cross Studios outside of London. Um, and it, it, it allowed them to do things like the DP would go in in VR and they'd be like, oh, it'd be really great if I could shoot this room. But, the, you know, the room on a boat is like a cabin. It's like, like this big. You can't fit a camera and a crew in there. So we would make a two-way mirror or we would just make this wall removable with a secret corridor actually built into the set. And we were able to do this because everyone could walk through this real set that didn't exist yet and make these decisions. To use that phrase from the start, it, it was a production performance enhancement. That would have been the kind of thing that we get to the set on the day. The DP says, I want to shoot from here. And one of two things happen, and neither of them are good. Either they go, I need to do this thing, and that's going to take time and cost a bunch of money because all my A-list actors are already here. Or the director says, nah, 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 don't do it, which is like, that could be the loss of a really good idea. And we want to avoid that. Great. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk, it was really interesting. Mm. Um, I've had a shoot like one and a half year ago with an issue that has bugged me ever since. And the issue was we had a proper color pipeline set up with the achievable color space and everything from there. But we used an analog camera in front of the LED wall. Meaning the first test, we, of course, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it wasn't the same lab <laughs> developing the stock um, as the ones they used on the shoot, so it looked different. Is there some way to approach it in a sensible way or is it just... It's it's work. really hard, yeah, okay. is the problem. Um, you said the stock was different. No, the, the development lab. So oh, the, same the development stock, same lab was camera, but they changed so, the lab in between. So to, to use a digital analog for that, mm -hmm. 
that that is like I've used the wrong color transform, or someone changed it halfway through my show, mm -hmm. and it's a really difficult thing to deal with. Um, f film film is hard, yeah, because yeah, you you it it needs stricter planning. There, there what film was it? I, I I have done something recently that shot on film. I was very surprised with what they got off the film afterwards because it lo it looks brilliant when you shoot an LED wall with it. Cause you're not dealing with uh, if anyone's seen it, Moire. Oh, so it's a nightmare with digital sensors, but analog cameras don't really pick it up. Um, Something else happens. Um, it's it's more about yeah, like strict specifications for people. So had it been said earlier in production, like in big red bold letters, probably with like like a, a currency symbol with a number followed by like seven zeros, and you said if you make this mistake, it probably costs something like this. No one would have let that mistake happen. <laughs> It's not a great answer, but yeah, it's, okay, it's, it's hard to get back from that because they use different chemical fluids, they use it in different ratios. It completely changes the color makeup of the film that you develop. And that is, unless you've got a way, this is, you, okay, so you could, if you've got a way to analyze what that has done, mm -hmm. you could transform it back. But that is like a science project. Okay, yeah. Good, <laughs> thanks. <you. laughs> uh, yeah, Carlos has told me to go up here. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, so you mentioned um, trying, uh, using ACES to keep uh, colors consistent throughout the whole show. So how did you, uh, for instance, in using the uh, VR headsets, how did you figure out what output transform to use? No, you don't. <laughs> uh, VR headsets are a bit weird um, because uh, for anyone that doesn't know, uh, VR headsets have like a pretty odd configuration. Um, they're 709-like on the inside. They tend not to be HDR, but they're capable of HDR-like values. Yeah. Um, so you, if you give them a color space, you, you might have seen this if you've tried it with a Quest, um, uh, things will get muted very fast, which you don't want inside of a VR headset. You actually do want it to be quite bright and poppy. So in VR headsets, we tend to tell them to not make decisions around color, but to focus on things like light and shadow. So compositionally, it's great. Uh, color is best. It's, it's kind of like the camera pointed at the LED wall thing. Like, do you look at the LED wall or do you look at the reference monitor? Because you don't watch your final film inside of the VR headset, it's maybe not best to pay attention to these colors, but to lay those cameras out, take the headset off, go look at the monitor that's calibrated for the show or has the look LUTs, uh, look LUTs for the show. So then you can evaluate it. Because, yeah, like c color in VR headsets is a. Mm. Mm, that's a, that's, a, that's a TED talk. I'm not doing that here. That's a SIGGRAPH talk. Uh. Okay, thanks. Thank you, sorry. I think we're going to have to wrap up the questions, but hopefully you can talk to Sam during... Oh, yeah, I'm hanging around. Just come grab me. I'm, I'm not that scary. I do talk fast, though. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. Uh, thank you, Sam. Applause, please. <laughs>